Welcome into Case Den Online. I am Mason Voth. That is Drew Galloway, and we are here on a Wednesday with not a lot of fun things to talk about. Uh, we've got K State basketball, which is they won yesterday. Woohoo! Uh, they don't look good in doing it. That was Mississippi Valley State's closest game that they've played this season against the Division One team. Prior to last night, uh, they had lost by 39 to Iowa State. Uh, and they were coming off of a 70-plus point loss to Missouri last week, uh, I think the same night that K-State lost to LSU. Then to make matters worse, LSU struggled with Charleston Southern at home last night uh, because, again, I don't think LSU is going to be a very good team. We also have football to talk about uh, because we talked recruiting yesterday, but we didn't really dive into you know Chris Kleiman a little bit of a different tone on Monday. K-State obviously has to re- regroup for these final two games. Uh, so we'll kind of hit on everything right now and just give you a, a cornucopia of crappy football and basketball and uh, see how everybody goes from there. But if you want to be optimistic, there are a couple things that can give you some optimism. They have nothing to do with what's taking place right now for football or basketball, but it's the fact that we are getting to be almost a month away from Christmas, which means we are into the holiday season and you can give the gift of Ireland this holiday season. Secure your tickets now through travel and hospitality packages as the Wildcats kick off the 2025 season in the Aer Lingus College Football Classic in Dublin, Ireland. Visit Cats2Ireland.com for more information. That's Cats, the number two, Ireland.com, and you can just start hoping that the Cats are going to be better next year. That's where you get hope from this from. Um, I think they will be. Can they fix those problems right now, though? Can K-State regroup in these final two games to close out the season strong where you're going to look at it and say, man, it wasn't a, it wasn't a fun year. That two-game losing streak in November is really going to put a cloud over the season, but you understand why some things may have happened. Can they regroup now uh, that the mood seems to be a little bit better? I don't know. We'll see. Um, but what is your expectation for this game with Cincinnati this week, Andrew? Because Cincinnati's a team – that has struggled lately. They've lost a handful of games in a row. They're going to be on the road, and they're they probably overachieved a little bit at the start of the season. And we've now seen them. I mean, they lost at home to West Virginia, which is not a team that you would think that you should lose to at home if you're you're going to be a good team. But look, I there there'd be a very good chance that K State could lose to West Virginia at home the way they've played the last two times out. So, uh, where where do you stand heading into the weekend? Uh, I'm honestly not sure where I stand at the moment. I, I think that this is kind of last week was a crossroads game in terms of it was elimination game for the big 12 title game. This week is kind of a crossroads game because you have both two, both teams that are really reeling right now. Um, and, and I think that that's kind of something that's probably the, the biggest headline is, which team looks more inspired and Cincinnati still fighting to get bull eligible. So I think that they'll probably have a little bit of fight, but if you've watched Cincinnati, I mean, they, they were not impressive against West Virginia really at all. The The final score of that game doesn't indicate how, how that game went kind of like how K state and Arizona state uh, last weekend, Cincinnati put up a little bit better of a fight in Ames. Uh, on Saturday, but I, I don't I don't know how if they'll be able to get off the mat. I don't know if K State will be able to get off the mat. But I, I will say that the the general feeling to me is better this week uh, with K State than it was last week, and, and I think that I mean all we've had so far this week has been a climb in a players press conference, but you didn't really hear or really feel like, okay, something is kind of off during the climate press conference this week that you did last week. In fact, he said that things are starting to trend better for him and his family. And, and that was, that was honestly my biggest takeaway of the entire press conference is okay. Things are getting better for him personally. And you would imagine that with that probably comes a better performance on the field. Uh, I think can't remember who posted it. Uh, on the board, I think, but it was in a fan's uh, statistical preview that he does every week of we're going to learn a lot about 
what this K State locker room is like this week because it's a younger team with a lot of young leaders and a lot of young players stepping up all year long. You don't have a shot at going to Arlington now, realistically. How do you build from last week and make this season better? Like, you still don't feel great, even if K State goes nine and three but you at least feel like you finish strong at the end of the regular season. And then who knows what happens at a bowl game because bowl games are just wacky now <laughs> in this day and age, but you could, you still have a shot, a shot to get to 10 wins. And, and again, you probably don't feel great about it and how you got there, but 10 wins is still 10 wins and nine wins in the regular season. is still a pretty solid season. If you ask me. Yeah, it's this is the the whole argument about that people had a couple of weeks ago prior to the Arizona State game, where it's what should expectations be, and is is this going to be a bad season or whatever? But you should never kind of poo poo nine, ten win seasons if they come about or whatever. And certainly, there's no reason to melt down over you know eight wins typically. But it's all about how it how it happens. I mean, there are years where Think of 2015. It was a miracle that that K-State team was 6-7. and seven. Like, pretty impressive that they did that. And then you think about last year's team and this year's team trending towards being mildly disappointing with what you left out there, and there's a very real chance. Last year was a 9-win team. They went, what, that ended up being a 9-4 a and four team. This year's team, they could very realistically be 10-3 and three if they get things flipped around. But you're going to look at it, and you're going to be able to assess – when and how the losses happened and just look at it and say that was inexcusable. I mean, that Iowa State game puts a really dark cloud over the 2023 season. Same type of thing is going to happen with the stretch that K-State got, just played. And now it's about, okay, can you adjust and, and can you put yourself in a position moving forward to where it feels like you're going to play better and you can get out of this hole? My real concern on K-State being able to do it, though, is that that should have been what happened last week. And certainly the Chris Kleiman, you know, personal stuff of this plays into it a little bit. Like when your head coach can't be as engaged as he needs to be and you have to be in college football, that's going to hurt. That's going to take some things away, especially when it's becoming more and more clear that you have an offensive coordinator that teams are probably starting to figure out a little bit more. It's getting a little bit tougher on him. You need to have, you know, your your big voice, the head coach, probably be a little bit more involved in certain things. Probably, you know, even if it's not just stepping in and saying, hey, we need to do this, you need more voices and that, and that number one voice right there that can step in and, and throw out a question, say, well, now why would we do this? Whether it's in the game plan leading up to it or in practice or whatever, um, when you have those minor distractions, um, and I say minor in terms of probably how they, they take your time away, uh, they're major distractions in life, but we've all worked through different things that have happened in our life that they're major in our life. But when you get, you get to work, you got to go to work and you kind of got to not focus as much on them. And it's really tough to do. And, and you're not going to be at your best. And obviously Chris Kleiman felt the effects of that. He, I, he feels terrible about it, obviously. And to me, I, I get that he's disappointed in himself for feeling like he let his team down. His team should be disappointed in themselves too, because Chris Kleiman is not the only person in that building. And they should have been able to step up and play better. Some of his other coaches should have been able to step up and have his back a little bit better. And they didn't. And that, again, is probably one of those things where you start to look and say there have to be changes next year. I think Chris Kleiman very much understands that based on pretty much the like the last two press conferences that he's had now. It's basically alluded to the fact without anybody really saying anything that would say, hey, you're going to fire somebody. He's basically made it clear that there are going to be changes of some kind this offseason. There has to be, you know, things get yeah. stale. But that that that's to me, K State uh, would have bounced back against Arizona State if they were the type of team that said, "Nope, the buck stops here," because that was an embarrassing loss to Houston, and you still had a chance to go out and win the Big Twelve championship. Realistically, there, like Colorado losing one game, not off the table, or you know, whatever else. Um, now you don't really have a chance unless total chaos happens, and that's not going to take place, I don't think. So that's the concerning part to me, and I I don't know what to expect in this game. I'll be optimistic about it. Um, I, 
I have more optimism in me for football just because the track record with Chris Kleiman is better, and I trust the the players and some of the other parts of this thing a little bit more than the basketball side, which we'll get to in a little bit. Um, but as I sit here right now, I I'm not thinking anything good about this weekend for K State football. They're going to have to go out and, and probably play a really good first half for me to change my tune and think, okay, this thing's going in the right direction. Yeah, I mean that that, that is a good point that last week was your chance to really do it. But I, I don't know. Last week was just so bizarre and how everything kind of transfolded. And you look and Casey probably played as bad as they could and still were a few plays away from taking that game from Arizona State. And I think that that is probably why I'm a little bit more encouraged because it felt like everything that could go wrong went wrong. But there were still a lot of things that need to be fixed. And like you said, there are probably changes that need to come in the off season. Uh, but I, I also don't think that people need to like really go after coach Kleiman after the press conference Monday. Cause that, that was like the, he, the biggest dialogue was everybody saying, why isn't he like saying that he's going to fire everybody? It's like, nobody is ever going to say that in a press conference that isn't Deion Sanders. <laughs> like yeah, well, he's the only one that I could think of that would say something like that. So a couple of things on the climate presser Monday, and this is not anything that he actually said, but it's, it's like the body language experts that the, you know, that was always the big thing with Skylar Thompson and everything that we talked about on, you know, KSO 1.0 over at rivals and everything. But number one, I saw people talking about Chris Kleiman's mood and attitude on Monday and the way that, you know, he didn't seem like a guy that was coming off of back-to-back losses. He was a little too cheery for my like. I think those were, were things that I saw. I think it is a good sign that Chris Kleiman is the way that he was on Monday, where he's obviously in a better mood. It seems like he is is like, and he said it, getting you know to a better place right now. That's a good sign moving forward. And coming off of that, he made it very clear on Saturday night how he felt. Like that was the most pissed off and distraught I'd ever seen him after a game. Both of those emotions in one, most that I'd ever seen out of him. And he also has made it clear with his answers that changes are going to be coming this offseason. I would be stunned if there is not at least one major personnel move on the coaching staff after this season based off of how he's handled minor questions that, again, I don't think were even totally directed at staff stuff it was like just trying to see hey you're going to try something different with the offense like even some of this simple like you know are wells and riley going to kind of swap spots on the field like all this other, and instead he just took it in a direction that made me think oh somebody's going to probably be on the outs after this year changing roles in a big way so i think that is something to keep in mind here is uh i think he realized he got it all out of him there's no reason to dwell on that and he talks a lot about not letting you know one one loss turn into a second one. Well, now he's really trying to make sure that a second loss doesn't turn into a third one. And so as long as his attitude and his mindset is in a better place, that should at least be the start of this team having their mindset and attitude in a better place. Now, can it trickle down to other places? Can they bounce back enough? Like how much of this is going to be shot? I, I don't know. Um, but there's at least part of me to where I can buy in to the optimism with K state football right now and still think like there's a real Avenue for them to win these final two games and for this season to feel a lot different by the end of it. Um, but I'm not going to guarantee it and I'm not going to be confident about it uh, because I thought they would do all that going into last week's game with Arizona state and they didn't. Yeah, I, I agree with you there. Like I, there are ways that they can get out of it, but until we see it, it's kind of just like a, Oh, wait and see. Uh, but I, I just, I don't know. I have a feeling that there are a lot of people in the building that are pretty angry, upset with how the game went Saturday. And, and there's a lot of older guys that this is going to be their last home game. And they came in with Coach Kleiman. And I think that that means something 
Uh, how much does it mean? We'll, we'll probably see on Saturday. Uh, but, I mean, we had Taylor Poitier was one of the guys that came in and was available to the media, and he was breaking down, talking about his last game and how much K-8 meets to him and how much uh, that he really wants to win on Saturday. And I, I think that there, there are avenues that this could go the opposite direction, but I... I think it's just the optimist in me that's like, okay, this track record is here. K-State off of a loss. It, it didn't work last week, but typically K-State off a loss with Coach Kleiman has been really, really good. And, and I think that there's still more hope and more optimism football-wise and basketball-wise because you know, we might as well just get into it. Uh, basketball is something right now. That's for sure. Yeah, uh, basketball, a lot less of a reason to be optimistic about it. We'll talk about it now because, uh, you know, if you thought that the loss to LSU was bad, which it was, um, somehow K-State found a way to make an 18-point win seem just as bad, if not worse, and it had even more to do with stuff that wasn't going on on the court because, obviously, the major storyline coming out of yesterday was Doug McDaniel didn't start, and not only did he not start, he didn't play a single minute in the game against Mississippi Valley State that K-State, again, only won by 18 against, quite literally, the worst college basketball team in the country. Um, you were there. What did you make of how it looked yesterday and, and how it felt? Uh, because, obviously, it was a pretty empty Bramlage Coliseum. It felt extremely gross. Like, to be honest with you, I wrote down an instant takeaways last night from the game that that was the worst half when you consider opponent I have seen in Bramlage in, in a while, that first half, where it seemed like the effort wasn't totally there again. And again, it's it's November. and we We can't be talking about how a team looks checked out but there there are times where it, it looks like K-State is checked out or that they get up a little bit and they just relax and let teams come back. And there, there's just a lot that I think needs to change. Uh, defensively, they are lost, to, to put it lightly, when it comes to rotations. And Mississippi Valley State, not just the worst team in college basketball, they're one of the worst shooting teams in college basketball, and they almost shoot 50% from three. Uh, K-State shoots 13% from three. Like, the, it was all around a really, really bad game. And, like, an 18-point win against Mississippi Valley State does nothing but hurt you. And that, that's the other thing that I, I close out on some takeaways with was that this is a game that was supposed to be a net booster for K-State where they can just beat whoever they play in this game by 30 to 35 points, maybe 40 points, and just run it up and get the net up and get that going well and get that off to a better start. Because last year, part of K-State's problem was that in these bye games, they went to overtime in three of them. This was essentially, I know that it's an 18 point win. This was essentially like an overtime game last year in the bye games. K State went down nine spots in Ken Palm for winning by 18 points and dropped five spots in the Bart Torvik rankings. I, 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 like this game did nothing for K State except really hurt them. And again, it, you just keep seeing people that know how much the K-State spent on the roster and know how much the Coleman Hawkins and IL deal is worth that are just making jokes about K-State. I saw, I think it was Kevin Sweeney again, uh, tweeted at halftime, one of the national college, college basketball guys, saying that K-State is really testing the theory of you can look good when you play Mississippi Valley State. I mean, it's it was not a good game. It was one of the worst 18-point wins I think that I have ever seen. Well, and this is the other thing that K-State fans and, and, and the personnel are going to have to address head-on. There are, you know, even leading into this, but this team specifically, that it's not just that you have that 
dollar value attached to you. There are a lot of things that this team as a whole brings to the table that people want to laugh at K-State. They want to pile on to K-State. The the stuff in Ames last year with, you know, the the Iowa State and recording or whatever the, the dust up with with odds and stuff like that. Um, obviously everybody, I think at some point, you know, it's, it's a fun story and everything. And then people get tired of the fun story. And so they turn on it. We kind of saw that, I think towards the end of, of the, the 2023 run. Um, and then leading in, like people like to, to go with that. And then obviously the personalities on this team, Doug McDaniel and Coleman Hawkins are well-known figures throughout college basketball before they even got to K state. And, People, when they get the chance, are going to take their shots at them and they want to take their shots at them. And so there are so many other things that build into all this, but you have to have things really buttoned up with the way that you act and the way that you play. And through four games now this season, K-State hasn't done it with the way they've played, and they really haven't done it with the way that they've acted either. Because obviously there's a pretty significant reason why Doug McDaniel didn't play after he looked like one of the two best players on the floor against LSU. Um, to go from starting for the first time, looking like one of the best players on the floor, to not even logging a minute against the worst team in college basketball, it tells me that Doug McDaniel is not acting right. And that is on Jerome Tang and his staff. They have to get that figured out. And this is something that you'll have to consider moving forward with the portal is making sure that I know that it's a, a furious sprint to try and get this stuff done. You want to acquire talent, but you have to be better about analyzing and understanding the personalities of these guys. Coleman Hawkins has not played right at all this season. We'll, we'll talk more on the play in a little bit. He obviously hasn't acted right either because everybody saw what went down between him and Cam Carter after, during and after the LSU game. You know, there, there's a line, obviously, that Coleman Hawkins is going to toe and push, and I think you want guys like that, one or two guys like that on your team. Um, but that only really works – when they're playing well and you're playing well and Coleman Hawkins doing what he did at the end of the game with Cam Carter is not great. And then afterwards, obviously they're jawing back and forth and, and trying to go at it. You just can't have it. And then you look around the rest of this team right now, and it's a bunch of dudes that are trying to figure out how to play at this level or in new roles. CJ Jones played the Missouri Valley last year. Uh, Max Jones played in the big West last year. He he's gone from division two to, to division one low major to now he's playing in the big 12, the best basketball league in America. He's going to try and play in it this year. He's got to get it figured out. You got in Yenso. He played it some at Kentucky last year. They really just stuck him on the floor to block shots and nothing else. And we've seen that because his offensive game is very raw. He has to get that figured out. So, and then obviously Brendan Hazen, he's, he's getting more minutes than he's ever gotten in his career right now. And that's something where he's going to have to manage and figure out, yes, he's a shooter, but you got to be able to make him. And two of 11 last night is not going to cut it. Now, those nights happen. And I'll say this, I think most of them were good looks for him. Sometimes I think he's going to fall in love with the little rush shot and try to reestablish. Yeah, I think he needs to realize he's not that kind of shooter right now. But I do appreciate him at least still taking open shots, even though he was missing them, because – that's what you got to do if you're a shooter. So I, I appreciate that mentality. But this is once again looking like a team that, I mean, the vibes are way worse than anything last year's team provided at any time. Because that team, at least, you know, they had all those losses where they were in the game in Lubbock. They should have won that game. They were in the game in Ames, you know, at the, the final TV timeout before everything went down with them. Like, they, they were in that game. They also beat Kansas last year. They beat Iowa State last year. Um, they obviously had their moments that did not look great, and they struggled. But that team, I think, had a talent cap that was put on them. Um, I think Jerome Tang came close to getting the most he could get out of last year's team. And I know people don't like to hear that because they just see a team that lost in the first round of the NIT and they're mad about what the situation with this year's team is, and so they want to pin that on Jerome Tang last year. I think last year was just a circumstance of the portal didn't fully work out how they intended, and also you have to remember they lost the depth piece at guard that they thought they were going to have, didn't play it all that season. 
They thought they were going to have Naquan Tomlin, didn't play at all last season. That drastically changes things for you. Now you can go back and say, okay, but think back to last year, personality-wise on this team. Obviously, Naquan Tomlin was a bad enough personality that he had to be kicked off the team. Um, that that was announced that wasn't going to stand here. Arthur Kaluma last year came in and had to get a little bit of an attitude adjustment. I believe he missed the game last year because of trying to get this figured out. So that's the one thing that I think you can really put on Jerome Tang right now and start to have serious doubts about is how is he on the person evaluation scale but with this? Obviously, the guys he brought in, we all think they're really good basketball players because um, they've all done things in their careers to make us think that right now through the portal. But some of the other stuff that goes into being successful as a teammate and being successful as a college athlete, because yes, while I don't give a damn about what your grades are, um, because I don't care. The only academics I ever cared about in school were mine, and I barely cared about those. So I certainly don't care what Coleman Hawkins or Doug McDaniel or you know David Castillo or any of these guys get on their you know college algebra test. Doesn't matter to me. Not one damn. But you have to be able to bring those guys in to where they can fit into the culture and the lifestyle that you have to live to be a college athlete right now. You do have to play school a little bit, and you have to play it a little bit better than what it feels like these guys are doing right now um, from just a – you're representing Kansas State University. It's not just K-State basketball, but it's a university, and when you do that, there are other things that you have to be able to uphold. feels like you're trending towards having more guys again right now that can't do it. And I said this after the LSU loss. This feels like the kind of team that at some point Jerome Tang might have to look around and say, all right, I got to do what's best for us. Even if there's some talent and a guy here, a guy there, um, if you can't bring the attitude up to speed, we're going to roll with the guys that we think can bring the most for us, and we're going to leave the rest of you in the dust and go from there and see what happens. Because while this team is struggling to kind of fit stuff together, I'm not going to in this thing right now. I'm not saying this season's over. It feels bad. It doesn't look like it's trending in a good direction. But it can be done. And I think that there are enough pieces at least where you could you should be a little optimistic that if everything comes to a head, you're going to have some guys that can piece this thing together and be competitive and see where it goes. Then there's still the the high upside path with all this, where once Guys like Hazen, the Joneses, get more comfortable in the roles that they're in. They are going to perform a little bit better, and we've seen some flashes from him at times. Um, David Castillo, how many minutes does he continue to get? I mean, the more he plays, the more comfortable he's going to get as a true freshman in there. Um, I mean, if we're talking about guys that, that care and are bringing energy and, and trying to do their best, Buddy Rich deserves a mention because – it doesn't feel like, even though I think there are still some limitations in his game in a big way, it doesn't feel like he's loafing it when he goes out there. He's trying his best. You want that from guys, and it feels like there are some right now that aren't bringing it. It's obvious with Doug McDaniel, apparently, since he's, he didn't play last night. And Coleman Hawkins has to be better. And I, I think we'll get there with seeing Coleman Hawkins play better. I, I, I think we do. There are some things to make you be a little bit concerned about it. Um, but I also think that at the end of the day, that's a guy that just really wants to play basketball. He wants to play it well, and he's going to have to either realize I'm not going to play basketball much longer if I can't get this thing corrected or I get it corrected and it all comes together for me. And by the end of the season, people are forgetting about being pissed off about the big NIL figure and only averaging six points to start the season. Yeah, I have a few things on that. Uh, so number one would be, you talk about wanting to get, or is there needs to be something done vetting guys and figuring it out the portal. It, not to cross sports here, but that, that's something that football has done really well the last two, three years under Chris Kleiman. And they, they had to learn. 2020 was their yeah. learning year. On and, they, and they had to learn. They learned how to adjust and how to do it on the fly and do it quickly. So you would hope that basketball, you could do the same because the football and basketball transfer portal windows aren't like too dissimilar in terms of length. So you hope that they can figure something out along that front. 
Uh, you pointed out Buddy Rich as a guy that was bringing the energy last night and has uh, for the first few games. I was really encouraged by uh, Ugana Onyenso last night. I thought he really brought energy and at, at a time where K-State really needed it. I mean, the whole game was was pretty rough, but it, it was 2-2 two to two when Onyenso checked in. And, and as soon as he checked in, it was, I think it was 10-2, to 12-2. Like right off the bat, and then he came off the floor, and that's when you saw Mississippi Valley State start to cut into the lead a little bit more. So, so I'd like to see him get a little bit more minutes going forward, because, and especially in a game like that, Mississippi Valley State had nobody that could stop him, and and that shows with him getting a career high and only missing one shot, and it was an alley oop. So, I think that that's something that you can probably be a little bit encouraged by going forward. But there, there really wasn't many positives from last night's game. The defensive rebounding was better. The the turnovers were a major problem in the first half, but were corrected in the second. Transition defense was a little bit better. But you can't be in, in a game like this where I thought that the takeaway from last night's game going into it was going to be okay. K-State's on the right track. They did what they needed to do. They beat a horrible team by 30-plus points. Like, it probably wouldn't look great, but, like, let's move on. You still won by 30, 30-plus. 30 like, let, let's go. This game is a lot more concerning to me than the LSU game because this was after the LSU game. You would expect K-State would have came out kind of guns blazing and wanting to and I'll just straight up say it. I'll, this is a game that you want K-State to come out and run up the score. This is a team that lost a game by 72 a week ago. They aren't very good. This is a game where you needed to come out and just hammer them, bury them, make everybody forget about the LSU game, because even if, if K-State wins that game by 60 last night, everybody's like, okay, the LSU game might have just been a one-off. Like, they're, they're looking better. Uh, the Virgin Islands tournament will tell us a little bit more. Now it's, okay, how many games does K-State win in the Virgin Islands? Because if they play like they did last night, I'm not sure if they win a game. Yeah, no, that's it's, it's a good point. That, that tournament gets a lot more interesting now um, because – it doesn't feel like you're going to learn about this team in a good way, but you could learn a lot about this team in a bad way. There are a couple of things on last night. Realistically, if K-State plays the entire game like they played the second half, there would still be parts where we go, it wasn't the prettiest, you would like this to be better, that to be better. We probably don't have as many complaints. K-State essentially did in the second half what you would have wanted them to have done the entire game. You would have said, okay, uh, the shots from three didn't fall, but you're pretty good from the field. You didn't turn the ball over that much. I was saying didn't shoot well when they beat Mississippi Valley State by 39. They were yeah. like five of 29 from three and found a way to still almost win the game by 40. And and I will give some credit to, well, I don't know it's credit, but make, make it known and clear here, um, is that for K-State, I at least like that Jerome Tang – didn't have the approach in this game of, all right, well, let's just give it to our bigs that are way bigger and way more skilled than their players and dominate inside. Cause that would have been the path to K state guaranteeing a 30 point win last night. Um, they did it a little bit more in the second half, I think because it was, well, obviously the game was close. So it was okay. We got to win this thing. Um, but it doesn't do you any good long-term to go into that game and just say, okay, this is how we can beat Mississippi Valley state. Now, Mississippi Valley State's an opponent where you need to kind of use it to try and get better with what you want to do and how you want to establish yourself throughout the, the season. So I think the second half was obviously a little bit better. It still wasn't pretty. The overall um, way the game played out didn't seem that great, but you'll take some things with it. You mentioned Yugana and Yenso. I thought he needed to play a little bit more in a game like that than he even did. Now, maybe, obviously, there are some restrictions there with um, trying to up himself. He only played 12 minutes last night, but 16 points in those. He needs, I think, more time in-game because he was just such not a part of what Kentucky was ever going to do on offense. 
that that part of his game is really going to to struggle and he's got to just play to learn how to get there. And I think that's a piece where he looked like a guy that was bringing it for you last night and at least cared, was playing the right way. You want him to be available to you later on in the season and you want him to be up to speed when that situation comes about. Now, as for Coleman Hawkins, I think this is something that people should keep in mind with 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 Hawkins right now is clearly this staff has some personality things that need to be figured out with Hawkins and McDaniel. Doug McDaniel came off the best game of his K-State career, short career, but the best game where it felt like he was turning a corner because he was back in the starting lineup and against Mississippi Valley State didn't play a single minute. So obviously they have there's something going on there that they're not pleased about. Coleman Hawkins has not played well to start this season. And he also had the issues with Cam Carter and some stuff post game. Yet he was still in the starting lineup and he still last night ended up going out and playing 31 minutes. I think what that indicates to me is that. Hawkins is at least in a situation right now where, number one, he's a smart enough guy. He realizes, yeah, I'm playing like crap. That can't be a lot of fun for him. Um, I mean, he said it last night after the game. And I think he also realizes that his personality at times can get him into a little bit of trouble and uh, can wear pretty thin on people. But I think that he, he realizes it at times and is trying to at least make amends for that. And I think that's the the one thing to keep in mind with Hawkins right now is that this staff has already shown that if somebody doesn't deserve to be out there for whatever reason, they're, they're not going to put him out there. Doug McDaniel was not out there. Arthur Kaluma last year was not out there for a game, despite the fact that he was probably the most notable portal pickup that you had. So I, I get that there's the larger NIL number that's that's thrown out there for Hawkins, but I don't think that has – anything to do with why he would be out there because I can't imagine the people that funded Coleman Hawkins to K-State right now uh, would be like, you know, I gave all this money. He needs to be out there. Um, I think at this point they'd be like, no, maybe you need to to send a message somehow or you need to do this, you need to do that. I don't think they're going to have any issue uh, with how Jerome Tang handles it. So keep that in mind. If there's a reason why Doug McDaniel wasn't out there, but there's a reason Coleman Hawkins is, Hawkins is probably a little bit further along in trying to rectify and improve his situation. And in terms of how he's actually played, it's a crappy start to the season. But think about last week, even going into the LSU game, we talked about, I think it was you and me. If not you and me, it was uh, D.Y. and I. But I brought up the fact that if you went and looked at Coleman Hawkins and how he started last season, uh, it was pretty clear that like he had a he had a bad start to last season that lingered for a handful of games. Um, it wasn't until the fifth game of, or the sixth game of the season, excuse me, that he scored in double figures. Um, he had a little bit of a turnover issue early on. He had five turnovers and a seven point loss to Marquette. Uh, that was a big deal, and he didn't shoot the ball particularly well. So then he eventually got it figured out. He kind of cruised from there. And I think that's something that could still come on because you look at him, he plays, he knows how to play the game. He makes passes. He does some really good things out there. I think sometimes there is a lack of effort and energy and he needs to be a little bit more locked in. He needs to probably have a little bit of a better attitude. Um, and also at times just try not to force things as much. But to me, there is, a way that you can see this coming together for him right now. So while it's bad and while everybody is very much entitled to handle that, how you want to handle it, I have a lot of optimism still that the Coleman Hawkins thing can get turned around. Now that's play on the floor. That's not me saying that this whole thing gets flipped around or um, there's a non-zero chance that this thing just completely blows up because it very well could for this team. I mean, right now, through four games, we have evidence to suggest that there's a better chance that this whole season goes to crap than it ends in another NCAA tournament berth. But I still will hold out optimism on the Coleman Hawkins thing. 
And this this three game stretch that they're going to go play in the Virgin Islands is going to be pretty telling uh, for what's going to come up in the next you know two three weeks. And then obviously once we get deeper into it and lead into Big Twelve play, and you you can kind of go and look around that it wasn't until um, those games in where were they? Was it the Cayman Islands that they were at two years yeah. ago with? With that crew. So if you go and look at how that season started, um, Marquise Noel's first four games of that season, he had 14 points against UTRGV, 13 against Cal, nine against UMKC, nine against Rhode Island. Then he exploded for 29 against Nevada and helped lead K State there, 18 against LSU. And Keontae Johnson, he had a good start to the season. But it was in that tournament where he made some plays that it just clicked. It was like, okay, this is going to be kind of the re- – like everybody sort of found themselves there. You, would you have liked to have had it earlier? Yes. Is there an excuse for not having it earlier? Absolutely not. They should have beaten LSU at home. They should have beaten Mississippi Valley State by 40 points last night. But there is still this path moving forward, uh, and and I do think we'll get at least a little bit of a look into it. Now, just because if they were to go and win every game by 15 this week uh, in this tournament, I'm not saying that that means they're going to be good this year, but it's at least would be a step in the right direction, and it would give us some indicator that it's there. The possibility of this thing improving is there. Uh, but that's on Jerome Tang and his staff to get to that point, and it's on a lot of these players to step up because you can't have your best players also be your biggest pain in the butts when it comes to – the personality and asking, you know, the effort and energy to be there. Cause the one thing that I know Jerome Tang never had to do was tell Marquise Noel that they needed a better attitude and they needed more energy from him. I've got absolutely no reason to think that that ever happened. But right now you feel like looking around and saying Coleman Hawkins and Doug McDaniel should be the two best players on this team. And right now they're probably the two biggest problems. Yeah. I guess my, my final note, would be uh, even though Coleman Hawkins off to a rough start, it it still is meaningful. I think that he still went and spoke with the media afterwards. There, he didn't have to, and he only had two points and really struggled shooting the ball. Uh, but still went in. I don't want to say face the music because he still had thirteen rebounds and tied a career high in that. And it's a lot of good game assists wise and steal wise, but when you have two points, I mean, it, it can be extremely frustrating. And I know that's taking a toll on him most likely because he, he's starting to hear it now from K State fans about kind of everything that's going on with the NIL money and everything. So I, I think I was encouraged by that, but as a whole, I, I think that, you're going to learn a lot about where this team is this weekend. Yeah, well, we'll see. I mean, it's because I think they either start to make some strides or they lose a game or have a couple bad showings in this thing this weekend. Um, You really, really need to see something good come out of this game Friday, which uh, will take place against George Washington to start up uh, their tournament in the Virgin Islands, seven o'clock tip time. That is an ESPN plus game for K state. Then after that, um, what it's the winner of Liberty and Louisiana. Louisiana. And then the possibility of playing McNeese uh, in the, the, the third and final game of that event. So something to keep in mind, something to watch for, and uh, we'll see how it goes. But right now, K state basketball is not providing any fun or a, a break in the pain that, K-State football has surprisingly dropped on everybody in the middle of November. Both teams are going to get the opportunity to start to right the ship and everybody's mood in Manhattan and anybody that's ever stepped through and taken a class at K-State this weekend. So we'll see how it ends up taking place. Uh, Basketball gets it going Friday at 7, and then football they get their chance on Saturday at 7 with Cincinnati. We'll have more on the Cats throughout the week. We'll talk more football tomorrow uh, and then Friday we'll have the full preview with myself and D.Y. Uh, as long as he's back uh, into 100% form. Uh, if not, Drew may be here filling in for him, but we'll see how it all goes. So 
That will do it for us today. Thanks for watching and listening to the KSO Show. For Drew Galloway, I'm Mason Voth. We will talk to you again tomorrow.